here we are in the world of classical architecture. We can see this immediately from the columns and the capitals, the pediments, the balustrades, the various statues. This is clearly the architecture handed down to us from ancient times. This is in the mould of the ancient Greeks and the Romans. And yet there's something different about this architecture. These buildings display a theatricality, a drama, almost a sense of over-the-top, tortured style about them, which is restless and questioning, even when it's at its most playful. Yes, this is classical architecture, but this is architecture from the 1600s in Europe. Welcome to the world of the Baroque. And a very warm welcome as well to this session of lockdown learning, in which we're going to look particularly at Baroque architecture. Um, we might have uh, a little bit of context in terms of the painting and the music, just to see how the whole period fits together, but it's mainly the architecture uh, that we'll be looking at. And this is a style which really divides opinion. Um, there are those who love the exuberance, the drama, the sheer restless energy of uh, certain Baroque buildings, which really can just blow you away with their virtuoso um, appearance. And there are those as well who hate Baroque, who find that it's full of uh, vacuous, empty gestures, uh, often sort of signifying really nothing at all, just just um, a sheer, a sheer over-the-top um, sense of frivolity. Uh, we'll look at both sides of those in this, um, but hopefully um, by the end of this video, uh, even those of you who are not quite sure whether you like Baroque or not, um, might have come round a little bit to this style. Uh, and certainly what I hope to do is to place it within a context, a historical context, which at least explains how Baroque developed and why, in my opinion, it's actually really quite worth exploring in terms of architectural styles. So let's put this into some kind of historical context to begin with. I always think it's quite worth doing that. What we had from the 1400s, the, 14, the early 1400s, um, at the beginning of the Renaissance, was a renewed interest in classical forms, particularly Roman forms. Uh, it started in Italy. If you're to believe Vasari, the Italians uh, had their Renaissance, even though there was also a Renaissance in the north of Europe. Um, but the Italians particularly were surrounded by Roman ruins, therefore Roman architecture, lots of vestiges of their ancient cultural heritage and so what we see is is a real interest in in looking back at what the Romans created what was good about the Roman culture and and therefore the artists of the 1400s began to copy Roman statues to look again at the way that statues were able to portray the shape of the human body naturally artists such as Masaccio at the beginning of the 15th century and then later um, artists such as Paolo Cello and Andrea Mantegna were really interested in, in fact, became quite obsessed with perspective in an attempt to capture the realism of what they saw as the, as the, as the future of art. And you'll notice in the background of this painting of San Sebastiano by Mantegna, a real interest in Roman architectural details, classical architecture, again, becomes something that architects of the time wish to recreate, first of all in Florence, later in Rome. So, although they're still building buildings such as churches and various religious foundations, the, the details, if you like, and even the structures of a lot of these new buildings start to look back at Roman models, for example, the basilicas or even the baths, looking at Roman vaulting and trying to recapture some of the, the, the elegance and the spirit of Roman and high classical architecture. And that's the Renaissance. And the Renaissance obviously uses all of these elements that we find um, in classical architecture, the column, the pediment. Uh, obviously, they're not building Roman temples now, obviously it's churches, uh, but those elements that we find in classical architecture are used very effectively to create a sense of classical um, refinement and almost 
striving towards a sense of quality which was felt to have been embodied in the classical tradition. And if we look at this timeline again and, and try to see the progress from Renaissance towards Baroque, we see that it passes through this rather vague term of mannerism. We'll be coming back to that very shortly. Um, but gradually we see a development from Renaissance elegance and purity and balance and harmony through towards a much more expressive, tortured, twisted style that we see in the Baroque. I think it's worth pointing out here that there are certain buildings in Northern Europe and especially in England which you could easily mistake as being Baroque. They've got the same spirit, the same restlessness about them, a riot of detail, all of which is Roman or classical. They've got obelisks here, they've got scrolls all over the place. Perhaps they've got intertwining patterns and buckles and belts. You see these in a lot of English country houses and, and French chateau. They represent um, the French and the English Renaissance style. These are further away from the centre, from Italy, so they've not got the same purity that we find in Italy when the Renaissance was developing. And of course, in England's case, with Henry VIII, we'd broken from the Catholic Church, so we couldn't attract the artists um, which would have come from Italy to do work on buildings here. And so what we depended on were pattern books that were imported through the Low Countries, through Holland, through the Netherlands. And these themselves were often pattern books full of architectural details which were, quite frankly, wrong or distorted or, or, or bastardised versions of the classical uh, detail that was happening in Italy. Just look at this French chateau. Yes, it's symmetrical. Yes, the windows are large enough for it to look like a palace rather than a defensible chateau. Uh, yes, the details are Roman. There's, there's Roman elements, there's pediments, there's lots of classical detail. But ultimately, deep down, these are details from the Renaissance stuck onto a medieval castle shape. And we notice this in English houses from the Elizabethan period. Wonderful examples of florid inventiveness, but they're not Baroque. These are English interpretations of what classical architecture should look like, and things are put in the wrong places. Obelisks are placed on top of gables or on either side of them to look like pinnacles. Uh, scallop shells are introduced in strange places. Everything's slightly topsy-turvy. Have a look at this. This is Burley House, and if you look carefully, not only are there all sorts of different shapes, pyramids and obelisks and, and various classical elements in, in all sorts of odd positions, but if you go up onto the roof, you'll see they've used Roman columns as chimney pots. And if you're a purist, then you'd know that this is not how you should use Roman columns. It's a truly wonderful building, but strictly speaking, it's a misuse and a misunderstanding fundamentally of the elements that we find in classical architecture. So to look at real Baroque we need to go back to Italy, we need to go back to the Mediterranean world and look at what was happening at the end of the Renaissance. So we would had the best part of a century of this development and re-emergence of Roman art and what we saw earlier on was that it was very very elegant, very serene, very reserved and restrained and what we see towards the end of this period as often with artistic movements is a sense of adventure within the whole system if you like, a sense of artists pushing the boundaries, twisting and changing the rules to satisfy their own art artistic striving if you like. Perhaps the most obvious example of this is Michelangelo. In his paintings we see an increased interest in, in adding drama to the forms of his, of his figures, adding a sense of movement and a sense of striving. And then of course within his architecture we also see the same. And in a way what this is now pointing towards is mannerism. Mannerism is a very vague term, actually, and it doesn't really have any definite dates. It just refers to that period 
beginning with Michelangelo, I think, when at the end of the Renaissance, artists and architects were striving towards ever more individualistic expression. Take a look at, for example, his Piazza Campodoglio in the centre of Rome. We have here a building that is clearly classical. In lots of ways, it looks fairly restrained at first, but when you look at it again, you notice it has these huge columns. It's not, it doesn't just have one size of column. It has three sizes of columns, if you look carefully. And the most notable of these huge, gigantic columns that go right the way across two or three stories. This is the first time that an architect has taken a building of several stories and tied it all together with one set of huge columns or pilasters which run the whole length of it and the whole height of the building. This is called the giant order and Michelangelo was the first to use them. If you look as well perhaps even more spectacularly at the interior of the San Lorenzo library, this is the entrance to it. The staircase is wonderfully expressive of this. This is Michelangelo's staircase leading up to the main door and, and there's there's hardly a straight line in it. It's, it's a complicated, almost organic shape. When you look at the walls, you can see that the elements that we have here, they, they look familiar. They're columns, they're classical window shapes, if you like. Uh, but when you look at them more closely, you'll notice that things don't quite make sense. Michelangelo is playing with the forms here that we think we know so well. He's pushed the columns inside the wall. That's really strange. Normally columns stand outside the wall. They're either detached from the wall or they're half attached and they stick out. These ones sink in. The windows are surrounded by shapes which seem to make sense, but actually when you look at them more closely, Nothing really is actually classical in the traditional sense. Bits are broken up, things are inserted in the wrong place. This is an architect or an artist playing around with the forms. Another architect whose work shows this kind of development is Giulio Romano. Uh, he was working in the Palazzo del Te in Mantua, in north of Italy. And again, looking at his work, you can see immediately that it's classical but he's already playing around with the forms. He's he's accentuating these keystones here. He's not lining things up quite properly. He's over-exaggerating the rustication. That's the texture of these stones. He's essentially breaking up the forms that we've got used to over the last 100 years. And by this point, in the early 1500s, he is he's putting them together in a way that just feels a little bit disconcerting, a little bit unsettling. And we see this also in some of the painting of the period. Look at these figures. They are much less serene in their posture, in their stance. Their limbs are twisted. Their bodies are twisted almost to the point that they don't quite seem real. This uh, famously, this Madonna with a long neck, um, all of her limbs are exaggerated. Mannerism often is all about exaggerated limbs and, and things are just too long compared with what we know they are in reality. And so this architecture that we've been looking at, this rather idiosyncratic architecture of particular individuals playing and experimenting with forms, this is now the basis for what happens next. It really is just a small step now to Baroque. As I've said before, Mannerism is quite hard to define. We don't have any definite dates, I don't think, for mannerism. It's much more um, uh, referred to as a sensibility, if you like, a feeling of that uh, change from the Renaissance into the Baroque. And we can see once Baroque really has fully developed that what it has done, it has taken all those classical forms and not merely tinkered about with them a little bit at the edges, but, but completely taken them apart. It pulls pediments apart, it twists columns, it, it makes walls um, concave and convex, and it does so in, a, in an increasingly playful way, but also in a way that's slightly disconcerting. Very often in a Baroque building, one feels it's, it's incredibly restless. There's, there's no sense of, of calm and serenity at the heart of it. Let's take one element and look at the way that it's changed 
in the Baroque form. If we look at the pediment, which is a very, very ancient Greek form, it's that very basic triangle at the end of a temple, which then becomes the triangle at the gable end of a church or on a palace. Until we reach the Baroque period, the pediment remains intact. It's a triangle. But increasingly, what we see with Baroque pediments is they are split in two, they are divided, they're pulled apart. Perhaps they are curved instead of triangular. Perhaps they're curved and split. And then on top of that, sometimes we'll see that they are concave or maybe concave with a convex bit inside. So there's a, a constant interplay of, of opposites and of uh, um, shapes which react against each other. Perhaps one of the best architects uh, whose work displays all of these elements is Borromini, who was working in Rome around the beginning of the 17th century. Here's one of his most famous churches, uh, the Four Fountains, the Quattro Fontane in Rome. It's right in the center of Rome, quite a small church, exquisitely designed. Um, just looking at the plan actually shows how many different shapes and curves are involved. Um, but also just look at the facade. As you look up at it, you can see it's not a simple box at all. Um, every possible curve has been exploited and you have these various shapes within shapes, um, convex, concurve. This is a, a, a real virtuoso performance by somebody who knew exactly what he was doing with these elements. His great rival was Bernini, who was working uh, around about the same sort of time. Just down the road is Bernini San Andreas. And you can see here as well um, exactly the same kind of elements at play. In fact, if you look carefully down the side, you can also see these huge scrolls, which are an element that we would have encountered in the early Renaissance, actually. Um, if we go right the way back to Alberti, working in Florence, he was the first one to use these great big scrolls which come down to hide the roof behind. Uh, these, these are uh, in, in themselves quite dramatic for the time, but they still are quite restrained in their detail and in the forms that they create. But look what happens to the scroll when it's in the Baroque period. We've got these ones here by Bernini on Sant'Andreas. If you go across to Venice, you can see a church uh, which is almost dominated by these scrolls on every single side. If we go back to Bernini and his work we find in Rome, not far from uh, the other churches that we've just looked at, um, an interior which is dominated by this chapel, the Chapel of Saint Teresa, who is featured there at the centre. Again, her, her statue has its own story to tell. It's very Baroque, it's very emotional, sensual, almost erotic. But just look at the stuff around her. This whole chapel is designed to look theatrical. There's the broken pediment that we mentioned, the curves and the shapes. On either side, we've got these architectural elements that remind us of a theatre. The whole thing is done as if there was some kind of perspective and that you're there at the theatre with these people on the side also in their boxes in the theatre. So there is a real playfulness with Baroque where the, the architect and the artist are, are aiming to create something more than academic. It's, it's, it's an, a tapping into the emotional and the slightly unsettling uh, feelings that perhaps one should have when one is in a very holy place. England for a long time was said not to have had a Baroque movement. Uh, and that was very much part of our national narrative. We did not have a Baroque movement because uh, we were Protestant and Baroque is particularly associated with the Catholic countries of the Mediterranean. Uh, but actually in recent years, uh, it has been reassessed and we did have a form of Baroque. It was a very English, very restrained Baroque. If you look at this church here in the Strand, uh, this has down the side of it um, alternating round and triangular pediments above the windows. These spires, these steeples, although uh, they reminded us deep down, if you like, of, of medieval church steeples, uh, the actual forms are just um, often quite a riot of 
of classical elements thrown together in in a quite playful way and and in a way which breaks various rules that one would have expected perhaps the most obvious place that we can find the baroque is in christopher wren's great masterpiece st paul's cathedral and not just from this angle where we've got this curved portico which in itself is quite baroque that reminds us perhaps of that roman church we saw by bernini just uh, a little while back but also the dome and the way that the dome is treated but no, it's not just from these angles that we can see Baroque elements in St Paul's. Actually, if we go right the way around to the front, we can see that, yes, although there's no curves and convex and concave elements and, and the pediment is not broken up, actually, there's plenty of detail here uh, and, and overall design that smacks of the Baroque. The way that the facade is divided up on two levels, the way that they have giant columns towering up over several stories. And of course, these towers with their interplay of convex and concave elements uh, building up to the little cupolas at the top. In fact, tucked behind St Paul's Cathedral is another Wren masterpiece, a very small church called St Vedast's. And this too has a sublime tower, which in its own very English manner happens to echo the Baroque movement that was going on on the continent. Um, and although it's a little bit later than some of the stuff that we've looked at on the continent, uh, actually it certainly still taps into that same spirit. But ultimately, full-blooded Baroque architecture was not really adopted here in England. And part of that certainly was political, uh, even if subconsciously so. Uh, there was a sense that it was a Catholic style designed ultimately for Catholic churches and the Catholic practice. And that's why the best examples are to be found around the Mediterranean. Let's go right the way down to the south of Italy to Syracuse. This is a fantastically elegant example, I think, of Baroque. Uh, perhaps it's because it's, it's so pure, there's no colour, it's just the white marble and you can see all of the lines and the way that things have been broken up and pediments have been inserted inside larger pediments and broken up. This particular church is built on top of a Greek temple. So when you walk down the side or, or when you're inside the church, you can actually see the original Greek columns of the temple that has stood here for over two and a half thousand years. That is that is wonderful, isn't it? But. Um, but it's the front that we're really interested in here. This front that was stuck on uh, in the Baroque period is uh, every bit of it uh, as good an example of Baroque as I think you can find. And the purity of the white is echoed here and there in other parts of Europe. If you go to the south of Germany, in Bavaria and Austria as well, uh, you'll often find some beautiful Baroque churches. In fact, almost all of the churches are Baroque. Here is the interior of the Theatina Kirche in Munich. It has the same scrolls here on the facade that we saw in Venice, but also um, on the inside, the whiteness and the purity just emphasizes uh, where Baroque could go when it was restrained enough to, to really sort of keep some kind of order. And there's another church not far away called the Wieskirche, which again is is white and pure in so many ways but it shows even more of those curves and shapes which define the baroque spirit and this is Vierzehn Heiligen, the 14 saints again another church full of baroque restlessness and striving but although i've shown you those churches which are able to demonstrate the purity of line through their, their sheer whiteness, their, their monochrome um, finish, actually, when we think of Baroque, we tend to think of colour. Colour plays a, a very important role in Baroque architecture, and that goes right away from the, from the little um, red cheeks on the cherubims that float around the inside of a church, all the way through to some of the, the um, uh, painted marble, mock marble, columns that you find um, around the inside of them as well. 
just have a look at this one here. This is perhaps one of my favorite churches. It's so over the top. This is a tiny church in the middle of Munich, built by the Assam brothers. And so it's called the Assam Kirche. And from the outside, it looks impressive in some ways, but you could easily walk past it if you weren't looking up. And as soon as you enter, you find yourself in a in a completely different world. This is a grotto of a church and, and it's crammed with um, ornate Baroque detail. And if it's not colour where Baroque becomes a little over the top, then it's in detail as well. And uh, for me, some of the most exciting of these are in Spain. It's unbelievable, isn't it? And although when you look at it at first, um, it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and there's a number of churches in Spain that have this kind of element to them. Um, when you look more closely, you can see that, yes, there are columns here. They're upside down. They've been changed into slightly odd sort of uh, square forms. Um, they've got little bits on the top that don't quite make sense. They, are, they, they support pediments and cornices that are suddenly curved and then broken, um, but they are still there, they are still classical. This is made of wood, and, and so the versatility of that material means that you can get a huge amount of, of detail out of them. And you can see this isn't just interiors, but exteriors as well. We find in, in Spain all sorts of uh, Baroque fantasies uh, and in Portugal as well. Possibly it's part of their national um, trait, if you like. Certainly their Gothic ended up becoming incredibly um, ornate in Spain and Portugal. You find uh, uh, what's called the Plateresque style, which is, um, which is, which is certainly Gothic, but, but incredibly over the top. Out of the Baroque age came one final flourishing of um, a style that was um, superficial and frivolous to the nth degree. And this is Rococo. And Rococo is, um, is full of forms that are even more broken up, that don't make any kind of sense sometimes in terms of classical structure. Uh, uh, a huge amount of asymmetry and forms that are so twisted that they they really don't look as if they belong to um, any kind of Roman heritage at all. Rococo becomes defined by a superficiality, if you like, um, a playfulness that becomes almost empty of any meaning, almost empty of any feeling. So some of the paintings from this period now, um, whereas during the Baroque period we'd had we'd had quite expressive, often quite gloomy, paintings, playing with light and shadow and drama. And and um, from this period, um, the likes of Rembrandt and Caravaggio um, uh, drew on the spirit of the times to create their masterpieces. But then after those, in the Rococo period, we, we tend to see that this just becomes very superficial and playful. The architecture reflects this. Here we see a lot more pink and blues and golds. And the forms do feel, don't they, rather more superficial. There's not that sense of uh, articulation with depth, creating shadow and a play of light and shade. Perhaps we can hear this in the music as well from the period. Baroque music is famously um, full of trills and frills and flourishes, uh, which actually in some ways disguise the themes underneath. So this is the period of, of Telemann and Vivaldi. Inevitably, uh, one thing leads onto a counter movement, and that leads onto the next counter movement. So, what we see in this period is is um, a, a response from one to the next period. So, clearly, for the Baroque period, the stifling rigidity and harmony of the Renaissance period needed to give way to something more dramatic, more expressive, more twisted and tortured, possibly. And then from that, once Baroque becomes so playful and frivolous in the Rococo that it becomes quite meaningless, we then see a counter movement, and that's when neoclassical forms take shape. So the next period after Baroque is, is a complete counter reaction. It's still using classical elements. It's still classical in spirit. But just look at how sober these buildings look compared with what we saw before. This is 
the world of neoclassicism. Good, that's Baroque architecture for you. Just a basic overview with enough examples, I hope, to give you a flavour of the kind of things that you're looking for uh, in a Baroque building. Um, I'm hoping that also that gave you uh, a real sense of the context and the way that Baroque fits together. And if you're still not convinced by the beauty of Baroque buildings, well then, the only way really to persuade you perhaps is to say, go out there and, and explore them in the flesh. Um, certain buildings um, are, are really quite remarkable when you actually see them for reality rather than just uh, looking at them on a screen. Um, if you've enjoyed that, fantastic. Um, please, please subscribe. Good. There we go. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed making it. If you're interested in some of the other things that I've got on my YouTube channel, um, check them out in Lockdown Learning. Um, there's some history of art, bits and pieces, and some ancient history things. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in another Lockdown Learning session. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>